Welcome back to At Home with the Dogginses. Hello, spooky friends. Welcome to the Halloween Horror Nights Report. Ooh. And by report, I mean this is mostly me telling Allie how Horror Nights was because she's not interested in going to such things. I am a coward. You did the Walking Dead maze once. And yet, I am a coward, so... (laughs) It was not your decision to do it. I did not make you do it. Friends who are unnamed who were in town convinced you to do it. Thanks, friends. (laughs) Thanks, friends. One friend, singular, really, but... uh... (laughs) Oh, I, I don't mind blowing up K-Dog's spot entirely. Thank you, Kristen, for that. <laughs> uh. She insisted on you coming along as we did The Walking Dead maze. I have known Kristen for about 14 years now, and Kristen's favorite thing to do is to make me uncomfortable whenever possible, so she knew this was going to be the greatest way to do it, was by making me do the maze. So. Well, my favorite thing to do is make you comfortable, which is why I did not make you come along uh, to Horror Nights, but I wanted to do Horror Nights. Uh... This was like the window where those of us who work Scary Farm could do Horror Nights because uh, back in 2019, Horror Nights went a few nights after us. So I went on like the very last night of Horror Nights last and I, time. And I spent like seven hours just chilling out like in a, a city walk like when you were doing that. Yes, by your decision. You thought it would be more fun to hang out at City to, to come with me for the drive and hang out at City Walk than to just wait around at home for me. Yeah, because I've been doing that a lot that fall, so... <laughs> Yeah, every knots night you were hanging around at home for me. And you're like, no, this time I want to get out of the house. And City Walk is open. Yeah, I watched a half of a movie that day. It was great. So <laughs> before complaining about the person in a seat near you. Yeah, that's a complicated story. Yeah. <laughs> well, this night you actually had stuff you could do at home. <laughs> This was last night. Uh, Toilets need to sanitize that can't sanitize themselves, love. So, <laughs> yes. So, this was last night as we're recording this, Sunday the 12th. And uh, I just woke up like 40 minutes ago. And it's currently 2 13 p.m. on Monday that we are recording this. <laughs> but yes, this was our window for those of us who work Scary Farm to go to Horror Nights. So, I went with Casey and with Chris Nebergall. And at the last second, uh, at first, Chris's roommate and Land Before Time Land co-host Madeline was supposed to join us. Then it turned out she couldn't. And then at the last second, it turned out she could after all. So Madeline was able to join us. And we had a lovely time. Indeed. It always felt crowded, but it apparently wasn't super crowded because most lines were pretty short. It, it felt crowded, mm-hmm. but not overwhelming. Mm-hmm. So first I get there again, Getting from Anaheim to Universal, I was originally thinking I'll go early in the day, just spend part of the day in the park, then uh, go out to City Mm. Walk and come back for Horror Nights. uh, I got there a little too late to really make any good time in the park, so I just hung out at City Walk, where I had a snack from Habit Burger, which thankfully has replaced Smash Burger. Hooray! Because I believe Smash Burger was what we ate uh, in 2019 before... uh, before Horror Nights, and boy, was it underwhelming. It was undersalted, among other things. <laughs> but uh, Habit is a chain I very much enjoy. Yes. And also, what used to be Subway, it uh, appears to be a Firehouse Subs going in there, and I am super on board for that. Mm-hmm. I, I love me some Firehouse Subs. Uh, City Walk is improving. Yes. <laughs> Nature is <It's> healing. healing. <laughs> so I get there, and I meet up with the rest of the gang. And uh, because we bought our tickets online, we had early entry. So uh, whilst, while uh, Horror Nights officially opened at 7, we got in at 5.50. And there were only three things open for early entry. Naturally. Which were the Terror Tram, which seemed pointless to do during the daytime. Mm-hmm. And uh, the two mazes in the lower lot. So we made our way to the lower lot. We inched our way downtown. Mm -hmm. We get down to the lower lot. The two mazes down there are the Exorcist and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Okay. The Exorcist, we look, it has something like a 50-minute wait. Mm -hmm. Texas Chainsaw is posted at 15 minutes. So we're like, well, let's do Texas Chainsaw. Even with early entry, the Exorcist queue just, like, fills the fuck up. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we did Texas Chainsaw. Again, posted at 15 minutes. It was... More like about a 20-something minute wait, but still. Now, uh, a thing that needs to be clarified is I have very little familiarity with uh, 
most of the horror movies they drew from this year, or in fact, most horror movies. I'm not really a horror movie guy. Neither am I. Uh... I, I know The Exorcist. Uh, I don't remember if I've ever seen the full movie, but I'm familiar with The Exorcist. I mean, it was a tradition because I'm from the area where The Exorcist was partially filmed, where you would just take like glamour shots by the stairs for, you know, mm-hmm. for boredom purposes, basically. <laughs> So I know The Exorcist, and I know uh, I've heard of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but I've never seen any of the movies. I don't even know. Like, I know there have been multiple reboots, I'm pretty sure, but I I do not know which Texas Chainsaw Massacre this was based on. I'm gonna guess the original, but I don't know. Uh, again, I know nothing about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, so, like, I, I didn't have the... The lore was not, like, you know, a big part yes. of your thing. I know there's a dude with a chainsaw, and he wears faces. And uh, so I could point at the dude putting on a face and be like, that's the dude putting on a face. Mm-hmm. But uh, even aside from just my lack of familiarity with the source material, this was kind of underwhelming, at least for the first maze of the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, the decor was fine, but um, it seemed underpopulated and i do not know how much of that was because we were kind of in the back of like a group of teenagers so like the characters were popping for them and then retreating to the shadows and we didn't see them much Mm -hmm. and i don't know how much is just because it was again 6 p.m and not everybody had shown up yet (laughs) and also it's like it seems to be a maze that they've done quite a lot before i think every maze this year is a repeat or Mm -hmm. or or maybe a a revision on an earlier idea like i think this was like the greatest hits year was what they were doing and i do not know how much of that was like covid related budget cuts Mm -hmm. uh the one that i'm pretty sure was plainly a COVID-related budget cut, is that one of the mazes this year was just reopening Walking Dead, which was a year-round maze, and then closed, and now they're just like, here, for Horror Nights, you can do Walking Dead again. Well, you know, technically, you could sort of say because it kind of ended once COVID sort of happened, it never really had, like, a closing ceremony, so you could have just said that it had just been on, like, hiatus for a little while. This might have been their way to say farewell to it. Yeah. But, like, all the signage is down for Walking Dead. Like, what used to be the Walking Dead entrance with a helicopter crashed up there is now part of the Secret Life of Pets land (laughs) aesthetic. So (laughs) That's, like, tonal distance right there. Just, like... (laughs) Exactly. So part of me wonders if the reason they closed Walking Dead was in part because it's like, well, this clashes with the nearby aesthetic of the land. (laughs) And I'm just like, Universal, when the fuck have you ever cared about that before? Tonal whiplash. Uh, but yeah, Universal um, reopened Walking Dead for tonight only because I feel I feel like it was a case of oh we never had a chance to actually take this mm-hmm. apart. Yeah, we can just run it again. Yeah. Well, I um I did watch our good friend Theme Snarks video about ranking these years' mazes, and I think that this is it is going to be open for the whole uh, the horror nights thing. Yes, it's going to be open for the yeah. run of horror nights, but I don't know if after that they're just going to be like, okay, now we finally take this part and mm. put in overflow seating for Starbucks or, or I don't know what. I mean, that big, big mood right there, overflow seating for Starbucks. So, <laughs> yeah. It is a personal insult to me. Yes. That at both Universal and Disneyland, there are fake facades of bookstores, but inside they're just Starbucks. Yeah. As me, a lover of bookstores and veteran of Starbucks, that is a personal attack. And and, and somebody who's a good chunk of their career was based inside of a bookstore where there was also a coffee shop to serve things, too. Like, it is a double slap of insult to you. Yeah, I mean, the least they could do is have some actual fucking books in there. I know people don't go to theme parks to buy books, but how will you know if you don't let them try? Exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, adult coloring books are a thing. You could totally, like, you know, sell a bunch of them there and have people, like, drink their Frappuccinos as they're just, like, drawing mandalas or some shit like that. Even if you just sell, like, tie-in books to the park. Like, even if it's really more of a bookstore the way, uh, like, the way a DVD store has a book section. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, DVD stores aren't a thing anymore either. Or or, or the way that, like, you know, technically uh, Barnes & Noble is like a Funko Pop, you know, uh, disposal unit now (laughs) with a couple of books for good measure. (laughs) Barnes & Noble, it's mostly Legos. (laughs) 
Did you see the TikTok of that? Uh, the the Barnes and Noble of New Canton, Connecticut, it has really managed to do some fun stuff with their TikTok. <laughs> but they uh, they did the one where it's like the uh, I found books, I found some you know it's like it's the audio from Charlie Brown's Christmas like I got a rock, oh. and the I got a rock was just the Millennium Falcon Lego set. It's like I got a rock. <laughs> like, <laughs> just <laughs> I thought they'd use uh, my buddy Mark Berman's. I got oh the no, old it, man's car. That, it was the old man's car. Yeah, yeah. I got the old man's car. There's a different one with the I got a rock one, yeah. but uh, a sound put together by my buddy Mark Berman from Fully Involved. <laughs> The most viral thing he ever did, and it has uh, done very little for his brand. <laughs> I've got the old man's car. <laughs> anyway, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre like was fine. It felt very sparse. We thought about going back and doing it again to see if it was better later in the night. Because mm-hmm. also at the end, there's like this sort of cemetery scene, which is open air, and it was still daylight out. So that was like probably more effective at after, night after sunset. Mm. And just to see if like it was better populated later in the day, we thought about going back, but uh, we never ended up going back to Texas Chainsaw. So that is my bottom for the night. That 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 was my least favorite. But again, with the asterisk that I do not know how much was because of circumstances. Mm-hmm. So then uh, we reassess. We head over to Jurassic Cafe where I buy a souvenir bottle. <laughs> For $17. I spend $17 on a souvenir refillable bottle. I don't usually do, like, I don't do the refillable bottles at Universal because they're confusing. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's like, it's not like the Knots or Six Flags bottles where it's like refills all year. It's like you buy the bottle and I'm not even sure if it's free refills that day or just like dollar refills. And then on top of that, to use them again another day, you have to pay like an additional $8 to reactivate them. That is so weird, man. On top of which, then you might still have to pay a dollar for each refill. I'm not sure. It's just always so confusing. And it's annoying because it's the only way to take advantage of all the non-Springfield freestyle machines. Springfield, for the first couple of months, the freestyle machines were free refills for an hour for everybody. And I was like, that makes sense. And then they changed it to just one fill, and it, it's like, fuck that. And then I was like, oh, souvenir bottle, and it's confusing, and I do not understand how it works. Yeah. And I do not think I'm actually necessarily saving money on this unless I get, like, 18 sodas every visit. Yeah, no, 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 no bueno. So I bought the souvenir bottle. It was $17, but it was free refills all night. It was free refills until 4 a.m., the the chip would tell me every time I put it on a freestyle machine. Okay. And uh, I only refilled it twice. So uh, (laughs) I did not quite get my... It was a big bottle that did not need to be refilled a lot, but not like so much bigger. Like, I think it was like a 32 ounce and like usually you get like a 20 ounce in Uh the the normal soda. So I probably did not get my money's worth out of it, but it's honestly a pretty sturdy bottle that I might just Use. use. Yeah. Like it might if, be worth just to bring it back one of these days to sort of figure out what the deal is with it. Oh, see if they can do the reactivation. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's worth a try. But it's also, stri- I, mean, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's hand wash only like souvenir bottles always are. Yeah. So it's probably less sturdy than it looks. <laughs> but it's it's like, it's a solid bottle that is currently chilling in our fridge full of cream soda from my final refill of the night. Naturally. Hey everyone, Future Dave here with a little addendum. Uh, About an hour after we recorded this episode, I went to continue my cream soda in the uh, souvenir cup, put the uh, souvenir cup down on the corner of my desk while I was working on stuff, far away from my computer, left the room for a little bit, came back to find the cup on its side and just a giant puddle of cream soda all over my desk with my computer right in the middle of it. Yay! Yay! I did not hear it tip over at all. It just decided to be on its side. So long story short, my computer is currently in the shop. Uh, Fortunately, when my former roommates and uh, the rest of my friends chipped in for the laptop, they also chipped in for Apple Care Plus. So uh, it's only going to cost about $300 to repair, but uh, still, that is not fun. So I am editing this episode back on the old MacBook Back on Final Cut 7, the software I was so reluctant to leave behind for so long, 
and the software I am having a hell of a time adjusting to getting back to. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the actual commands are kind of like riding a bike, but uh, the workflow is no longer as snappy as it once was, uh, even when the computer was slow. I'm not as fast at it anymore. So, uh, looking forward to my computer being back. I can definitively say the souvenir bottle was definitely not worth the money. Neither the almost $20 it originally cost, nor the almost $300 in damages it later incurred. But, you know, maybe you'll get more use out of it than I will if you go. And now, back to the episode already in progress. So then, uh, you know, we do our bathroom breaks, we do our snack breaks, and we're like, okay, it is, like, 6.45 or so. We can do one of two things. We can either do Exorcist now, which still has a wildly long wait time, or we can go to the upper lot, which by the time we get up all the escalators, things will start to be open for real and mm -hmm. just knock out, just go straight to things that have kind of short waits because we're early in, in there. Yeah, yeah. And them being open. So we decide to go to the upper lot. Now, uh, long-time Hollywood Horror Nights aficionados may know that usually they do some uh, mazes out on the New York Street of the back lot. They were not doing that this year, mm -hmm. uh, which is a mixed blessing. It's like part of the thing, like to get there, you have to walk from the lower lot, like right past Transformers, past where Texas Chainsaw is this year. Texas Chainsaw this year is where Exorcist was last time they did Exorcist, uh, so it was funny to just see it move across the street, basically. To get to the New York street lots, you have to walk a long fucking way because you have to walk to the back lot from the lower lot. Mm -hmm. You have to walk under this tunnel where they usually have like chainsaw guys and loud EDM music and strobe lights playing, mm -hmm. which is kind of a scare zone, but it's really just an annoyance. <laughs> um, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you have to walk through all that to get to the New York streets and... They were not doing that this year. Instead, where they placed some overflow mazes this year was on the old uh, Curious George lot from before they built the Curious George Garage. Oh, okay. And to get to that, you have to walk through Hogsmeade. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big fence at the back of Wizarding World was open. And you could walk around and it was like in the shadow of the other parking garage. And we were pointed out all the places you used to be able to easily sneak into the park without paying, but, uh -huh. but they've since clamped down on uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. on that being feasible with the newer construction. But uh, it used to be very easy, apparently in part because there's like 17 different businesses being operated on that property because there's like, there's the theme park, there's the movie studio, there's, yeah. there's production, there there's mall operations for CityWalk. And it's like, if somebody sees someone walking backstage, as long as they look confident, someone will, like, everyone else will just assume, that person's probably supposed to be here. Yeah. But now that uh, Harry Potter is there, it's a little harder to sneak in in those areas. No, of course. Uh, so do not sue me, Universal, for spreading this information. <laughs> I, myself, have never uh, partaken in sneaking into a park for free because I am way too anxious a person to pull that kind of shit off. Y y your anxiety makes you a very honest boy, so. Exactly. I I, I cannot tell a lie because uh, my body will not allow me to. <laughs> but anyway, and having the entry route be through Hogsmeade, that meant that this is the first time ever that Wizarding World was open during Horror Nights in, uh, in the U.S., because uh, J.K. Rowling apparently was specifically not wanting it to be part of the Halloween event because she's like, no, it's a family thing and your Halloween event is an adult thing. But uh, I don't know if she relented on that or if Universal was just like, I think it's okay to not honor all of her wishes these days. Yeah. I have a feeling it's probably she relented because uh, I'm sure they have a lot of very tight contracts and everything. But uh, oh, fully, yeah. But, you know, we, we, were, we were doing a hearty fuck you, J.K. Rowling, while we were walking to Hog, uh, Hogsmeade. Mm -hmm. They did do a pretty cool nighttime uh, projection thing on Hogwarts when we were coming back. Like, nice. pretty, pretty cool, like, Deathly Hollows projections and stuff. Um, so that was neat. But uh, we walk over to the thing. The two mazes in this old George parking lot are uh, 
Netflix's The Haunting of Hill House, and that is the full title of the maze, Netflix's The Haunting of Hill House. Uh, and that one, I believe, is a new one, because that one's only been in Florida before uh, yes, now. Yes, I, I think that sort of came from Florida, because Haunting of Hill House is a more recent show. And then Curse of Pandora's Box, which is a rerun from 2019, which is the like original maze they did, but it only was an original maze because I, I believe the story is they were designing a Hellraiser maze. Fun. And then at the very last second, they lost the rights to Hellraiser. So it's kind of a palette-swapped Hellraiser. Okay. Uh, Curse of Pandora's Box, which... Um, so first we did Haunting of Hill House, and that one was a, about a 15-minute wait, give or take. Again... I have not seen Haunting of Hill House yet. Neither have I, but that's been on like the to watch list for both of us for a while now. Yes, but this maze was really well done. And uh, those of us in our group who had seen the show were saying, yeah, they did a good job of doing the things from the show. Now, the Haunting of Hill House, I always forget because there's the Haunting of Hill House. There's the House on Haunted Hill, which is different. Mm -hmm. And then is the Haunting also the Haunting of Hill? Is that based on the same source material or is the Haunting a different thing? The Haunting is a different thing. Okay, so there's the Haunting and the Haunting of Hill House. So here's the easy way to remember. The Haunting is the one that Vincent Price started in the 50s that's been like remade a few times. No, Vincent Price was in the House on Haunted Hill. Oh, the House on Haunted Hill. Yeah, that's the yeah. that's a that's the thing. I think the Haunting itself is a whole different. The the Haunting was is a third genre. I know the Haunting was an older movie, which was then remade with Owen Wilson getting decapitated. Yes, um, which is the joke everyone's going to now that he's been announced to be in the uh, next Haunted Mansion movie. But of course, my go-to was so now both of the stars of the 2002 remake of I Spy have yeah. been in the Haunted <laughs> Mansion. I think the Haunting that. Haunting is a remake of the House on Haunted Hill. Not the Haunted, not the House on Haunted Hill. The Haunting is a remake of the uh, the whatever involving Eleanor Crane. That's the, what the remake of that is. The Haunting 1963 film. Okay, it is based on the Haunting of Hill House. It is. It okay. Is, yeah. 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 It it it, it is the, it, it is based on the book. So the the Owen Wilson movie that was the remake of that that was the uh, main basis for Scary Movie Two. <laughs> Um, that's always wild yeah uh that one was that one is an adaptation of the same source material as the yeah yeah because that's the one with uh, okay. Ka- Catherine zeta jones right yes that was the yeah, yeah, yeah. one and then there was the 1963 one which was cited as one of the main influences on the haunted mansion the way that uh mm-hmm. african queen was an influence on the jungle cruise which we either talked about recently or will talk about soon depending on which order i edit these episodes mm-hmm. in <laughs> But uh, anyway, Haunting of Hill. So I am passingly familiar with some of the iterations of The Haunting, Mm -hmm. but uh, I have not read the book. I have not uh, seen the Netflix show. From what, like, images I've seen from the Netflix show, they got the aesthetic down. Um, There was an interesting thing, because again, LA County guidelines, there was an interesting thing where makeup characters were wearing just, like, normal COVID face masks. (laughs) <laughs> which uh, was a little bit of suspension of disbelief, but not any worse than when you just see emergency exit signs or uh, just, mm-hmm. you know, maze attendants just standing there with flashlights waving you along. So, mm-hmm. so you know, not a suspension of immersion any worse than you ever get in a maze, I thought. But, uh, but it was amusing. But yeah, Haunting of Hill House, uh, the maze was good. Then we went to Pandora's Box. Which, when we got in line, the wait time was posted at 50 minutes. But then, as we were in line, we saw that the wait time had gone down to 15 minutes. There we go. It ended up being more like 20, but mm-hmm. it was it was fine. And, uh, yeah, Pandora's Box is kind of a mishmash of ideas and mythologies. Because, again, there's Pandora's Box, there's Medusa, there's general, like, skeleton and zombie stuff. Yeah. It, it's kind of just, like, a horror maze. Mm-hmm. And I enjoyed it. It wasn't particularly mind-blowing or anything, but I enjoyed it a lot. And, uh, you know, it's got skeletons. It's got, like, spider people. It's, it's, uh, it's got fun stuff. So then we uh, go out to uh, the Universal Plaza area where uh, in the sort of plaza courtyard, they're doing, like, a Dia de los Muertos thing. Oh, very cool. Where they've got, you know, food and drinks and also photo ops and, like, character meet and greets with, like, general... Dia de los Muertos, like, skeleton types. Mm -hmm. And they also had these two carts where they had these animatronic skeletons doing a back and forth. Like, it was was this boy skeleton at a cigar 
uh, uh -huh. sales cart and a girl skeleton at a taco cart. And I could not tell if they were being live controlled or if it was pre-recorded. Mm -hmm. They did not interact with any of us, which made me think like they only talked to each other, which made me think it was like Tiki Room style pre-recorded. But from the uh, mm -hmm. like the <laughs> the performances sounded very live in the way that like the the donkey puppet uh, mm -hmm. character like the Shrek donkey does. So it could have been live performance, but they were just looking at a script and not talking to people. Mm -hmm. But then I don't know what it would have bothered you live performance, but it was neat. So then we go over to the maze we were all looking forward to. Uh, Bride of Frankenstein lives, I think, mm -hmm. the bride one. And it was basically a walk-on at this point. And this one was really cool because this one was really effective at telling a story. Okay. And part of it was like, they had these big uh, these big wall murals as you were going into uh, certain zones of the maze that had like, you know, chapter one, chapter two, and, and like a, a chapter heading. So it's like chapter one, saving the monster, chapter two, et, et cetera, et cetera. And it's telling this story where like the monster of Frankenstein died and the bride was like, he's the only one who ever showed me kindness. I must save him. And basically it is the bride resurrecting the monster. Okay, okay. And fighting off these vampire ladies, but also, like, trying to get their blood to bring him back to life. Mm -hmm. And it's this really cool thing. This was the maze that's in, you know, every year they do a maze in, like, the little French alley. Mm -hmm. So this was the one in the French alley, which made good use because there was one little open-air part where you're, like, going into a building, but in open air. And it made good use of the already built in uh, architecture of the French area around. So like oh, awesome. you're looking up at the roof of this building, you're going in and it really matches with the roofs of the alley. Very cool. But yes, it's very cool. The bride wearing a face mask the whole time brings the monster back to life and fights off these vampire ladies. And then you exit right into the, uh, the scare zone that's called something, something like scream queens of the screen or something mm -hmm. the lady monster scare zone oh okay okay and so it's dracula's daughter and of course the bride herself and the lady mummy but not the lady mummy from the tom cruise one <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the lady mummy from the old one and it's, it's it's all the horror ladies in the scare zone and and they had these uh like screens all around i think they were the same screens they used at that one scare zone last time but they had these screens all around that were showing the uh, the trailers for the different movies they're from as these horror mm -hmm. ladies slink around the streets of Paris. Oh, and that's cool. It was pretty cool. And it was much like how last time they had the holidays one unload into the Christmas scare zone. It mm -hmm. was it was a good marriage of uh, maze and zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then after that, we do Terror Tram, mm -hmm. which is uh, The Purge again. Okay. It was The Purge back in 20... 16 i want to say mm -hmm. it was the purge when we went when we were all doing a tony's haunted mansion review okay um, okay and this was basically the same thing as it was that time i think they might have changed up some elements of some of the videos because there were parts i remembered from the videos last time that were not in at this time but i mm -hmm. don't know if they just changed things around slightly there were other parts i haven't looked at footage from that year recently so i don't know it might have all been the same and i just was remembering things wrong uh, the one thing I did not experience this time that I distinctly remember from that time is that, uh, like, we were not in the queue very long. It, it was uh, it was a very fast-moving queue, so it's possible it just didn't get to this part of the queue video loop. But I remember last time at one point in the queue video uh, for part of the, like, Welcome to Purge Night, like, video, they were using just the free music that comes with MacBooks with like mm -hmm. GarageBand yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and iMovie. They were using one of those free tracks and I'm like, right, because it's not like there are any filmmaking professionals on this property of course who, not. Who, who, yeah. who would put effort into <laughs> such things. It's not like they have a stock library of their own music that they own. Yeah. This, this multinational movie company that has existed for over a century. Yep. Yep. But I really like uh, the premise of the Purge Tram 
because the idea is like we are on a VIP tour being taken to a special purge party where it's like we're the rich people who are in a safe space looking down on the... Uh, on the purgers. Yeah, yes, on the plebeians. On the Kevin purgers. <laughs> <laughs> looking down on the plebeians who are going around purging. But it turns out it's all a trap and they're actually going to kill us and, and unleash us into the purge. Which is, I think, a clever device, mm -hmm. like like a clever narrative device. And so then they unload us, like, going around towards, uh, like, they unleash us right before where the uh, Grinch sets used to be. So uh, now it's just a bunch of cars parked there. But then you walk around, like, the Bates Motel as Purge people swing axes at you and stuff. Uh -huh. And you can, if you choose to wait in a separate line, stop to get a photo with Norman Bates on the steps of the Psycho House. Uh, we opted not to this time because mm -hmm. that line was longer than uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. than most things. But then the part where I think using the purge for the setting of Terror Tram really works is that then you walk through the War of the World set, the big plane yeah. crash, and recontextualizing that plane crash as like shenanigans during the purge brought an entire fucking plane down mm -hmm. is again. I have never seen any of the purge movies. I don't. I don't yeah. know. But I know the general concept, and I'm just like, that is just a good use of your resources. Oh, fully, fully. To have that be what you're doing. So then you get back on a tram, and you're, you're like, rescued and brought back to the park. I do think it's funny that uh, part of the pre-show is, like, they acknowledge, like, Universal Studios is, proud, is a proud sponsor of The Purge. And it's like, really? <laughs> Really, this is the branding you want to go with. Comcast, the the giant media conglomerate, is like, yes, we support politically the people who uh, make crime legal for a night. Yeah, this is what you're going with. Well, because this, okay. this is a way for them not to have to pay stuntmen. It's just kind of like. <laughs> I always thought about that. Like, what if people use use the purge for just like uh, white collar crime? Yeah. <laughs> people people use the purge just to like cheat on their taxes. Haley once pitched an idea that was like the purge in Mayberry. <laughs> <laughs> nice, it's nice. Like Otis gets drunk and then doesn't lock himself up in the cell. <laughs> uh, Honestly, if I had purge powers, what I would just do is I would just go to I like pie and just take all the pie and not pay for it. Mm. If I had purge powers in the place to be, um, if I had purge privilege, yeah, I think I'd just jaywalk a bunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mostly would just steal donuts. I, I probably would do, like, one... I would break every NDA I would ever have had to sign. Uh, yes, that's exactly what we would do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a couple. <laughs> I don't really have anything juicy in any of my NDAs, and I'm pretty sure most of my most of the NDAs I've signed have since uh, expired, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but, yeah. But uh, one accumulates those when working in production. That would be literally the best use of purge powers. Just sort of like, you know, everyone just breaks their NDA for the day and just be like, hey, it's the purge. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'd, I'd just do a bunch of victimless crimes. Yeah. Like like stealing from well-insured banks. Yes, I don't know. yes. Well-insured but not well-guarded, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'd go hit up every bank in Grinch, Connecticut. <laughs> I would defy the Homeowners Association and not water the lawn. <laughs> I would replace my lawn with a garden. <laughs> <laughs> replace the grass with moss. And then once purge night's over, it's like, it's too late to change it back. Um, I will not be taking my garbage cans directly back into the uh, into the garage at 702. Karen, it's gonna, purge night, bitch. <laughs> I'm going to recycle number three plastic. <laughs> so then... I'm going to wear white after Labor Day. <laughs> fashion crimes on purge night <laughs> there's an episode of girl meets world where mm -hmm. like to teach them a lesson like Corey, as the teacher is like okay what one day no rules in this class and like it devolves into like a lord of the flies scenario of course <laughs> but uh i remember when nick was watching through girl meets world we were like it's too bad we're not doing like a review recap show of this so when this episode comes up, we could just cut to the Rick and Morty. It's a purge planet, Morty. It's a purge planet. <laughs> One planet just calls it Murder Night. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're picked up by the tram. And uh, the tram driver says, and now a message from a friend of mine. And then Chucky appears on the video screen. Nice. 
And it's not like much of a thing. It's really just a trailer for the new Chucky TV show that's on USA and Sci-Fi. Of course. Um, so, yeah, new Chucky TV show, which is separate from the Child's Play reboot with Mark Hamill. Because I think, I think it's like a Casino Royale situation where, like, the name Child's Play and the character Chucky are owned by different concerns. That's wild. So, yeah. Yeah, it's weird. But then we decide to... Uh, Go back to the lower lot and knock out Exorcist because it's still like an hour long wait. And we're like, okay, it's not going to get any shorter. So we go down the escalator and that's when we notice that the safety rules on the escalator are being read by Chucky. (laughs) Nice. It does not sound like it's Brad Dorif, but it sounds like it's someone doing Brad Dorif. Mm -hmm. And I also imagine he's like, bitch, I was in Lord of the Rings. I'll do the TV series, but I'm not doing the theme park safety rules. Valid. (laughs) Um, Actually, uh, what we decide at this point is that we're hungry. That mm. Now I remember. Before we do Exorcist, we decide to get food. And the only special food offerings for Horror Nights are on the lower lot at Leatherface's Barbecue. Of course. Uh, again, with the Texas Chainsaw theme, even though it's not like right next to the Texas Chainsaw Maze, but it's, you know. Did they take over like the, uh, um, the Jurassic Park Cafe for No, or? what they did is they built a little pop-up in the space between the Jurassic Cafe and the uh, Panda Express. So, so they built a little like uh, woodsy sort of barbecue oh, facade fun. Okay. in like a tent. And uh, a lot of Coca-Cola signs because, you know, Coca-Cola, proud sponsor of Leatherface. Mm-hmm. We serve barbecue, a bunch of rustic looking signs. So how was your human meat? It was fine. I, I had the uh, the pulled chicken sandwich with Coca-Cola barbecue sauce. All right. And it also had like high school cafeteria fries that came with it. It's, it's like, it's like, come on, Universal. I've had better fries here. And your fries normally are not that great, but they're yeah. better than this. Um, there was also like uh, ribs, I think. And there was a monster hot dog, 22 inches, which seemed like too much for me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And there was a Texas chili and cheese nachos. But yeah, I went with the pulled chicken and it was fine. As expected. Not particularly great. But then after that, we're like, okay, Exorcist isn't getting any shorter. Wait time was supposed to have 55 minutes. It ended up being 50 minutes. So slightly Mm -hmm. shorter than expected. Wahoo. Still far and away the longest line of the night. And Exorcist is in the uh, soundstage behind Transformers. Mm -hmm. And to get there, we actually had to go into, they had to open up the uh, Super Nintendo World work wall. Oh, wild. For us to go in. There was another, like, fence up, so we couldn't see much of the construction. But we could make out the shape forming of the warp pipe that you will walk through. Oh, that's awesome. That's Uh, awesome. uh, It's not, like, covered or anything. It's still just, like, support beams going in there in the shape of the warp pipe. But, uh... It was a chance to get hype. But yes, this was a long line. And the line was so long, Madeline was like, what's that game that normies play in theme park lines? Heads up. Mm -hmm. So she downloaded the app and we played a couple rounds of Heads Up. uh, The the one where it's charades or scategories or whatever, but you just put the phone to your forehead. We played uh, movie titles and it was fun for about five minutes. Of course. Um... But then at a certain point, the queue continues inside the soundstage. Mm -hmm. And once you got in there, it was too noisy for anything. I can imagine. And this was, uh, like, we still had, like, 20-something minutes of queue left once we got in this loud soundstage where you can see, like, the backs of the maze facade and everything, and you can hear the sounds coming from inside the maze. But... (laughs) The sound's coming from inside the maze. But they try to drown that out with other sounds on the outside, like speakers doing just like sound bites from the movie and like the soundtrack and everything to... uh, Oh, that just sounds like total whiplash. To pump you up for Exorcist. Yeah, it was noisy and chaotic. And yeah, they, much like last time they did Exorcist, they built the uh, exterior of the house. But again, this time it's inside a soundstage, so it's not as cool as last time when it was in the... uh, the exterior space, the the tent next to Mummy, where Texas Chainsaw was this year. Because mm-hmm. then it was like, hey, it's a house outside where houses be. Yeah. And now it's are. like, there's a house in this house. Yes. But yeah, Exorcist, it was basically the same as last time, except they flipped around the, uh, the direction the bedroom was facing. Oh, okay. 
that was the only major difference I noticed from last time that did Exorcist. Mm -hmm. I think it was still all the same beats. Like you go through the bedroom like three times and then it's just dark hallways in between. And in those dark hallways, people just like dressed in black, but wearing a Pazuzu mask will jump out at you. Okay. Which is m more like conceptual, I guess. Like, like, yeah. It's like, how do you do jump scares in The Exorcist? And it's like, I admire The Exorcist for trying to figure out how to do a maze from a movie that takes place basically in one room. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But we kind of came to the conclusion that The Exorcist would be more effective as like either a scene in like a greatest hits of horror maze uh -huh. or as like uh, an interactive like theater space or something. Yeah. Not something where you're walking around and keep walking. Like uh, it almost being like an escape room. Yeah, that could like, like something like that. Cause then you could brand in like that horror film escape room. That's now <laughs> has, I think two sequels going on and then just do that too. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, but yeah, it's like the first time you go through the room, uh, you know, uh, Reagan's thrashing around on the bed. And then the other times it's like a mannequin of her in various positions. And like one time it's her doing the vomiting and they spray water at you because it's universal. Of course. And then like one time you come in the room and she's like, the mannequin is levitating above the bed. And, uh, at, at least one of the times the jump scare is the, is the titular exorcist, the preacher there mm -hmm. who is like, I don't know if this was what the move was supposed to be, but this was the move this character did. He was, like, throwing the holy water at her, but doing the motions very rhythmically as if he was an animatronic, and then he just lurched toward us at a certain point. Nice. <laughs> Which, you know, no shame in the uh, living statue move. I've pulled it myself many in times. Indeed you have. Uh, so, yeah, Exorcist... I admire its ambition more than I actually enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Its ambition in doing a maze... It's ambition for crafting the sense of limited ambition. Yep. There was a film I watched recently on the Criterion channel that uh, Dave didn't watch called uh, Cruising. And a portion of this movie is based on one of the character, one of the actors in The Exorcist, who was a radar technician in the film. But then it turned out that he was also like a mass serial killer as well that no one had no known about. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's like, it would be great to kind of have, like, connect this weird movie about BDSM murders from the 80s with the extras by having, like, you follow the radar technician that just go slash in the throats <laughs> of all these, like, leather daddies. Like, that's a way to make it interesting. That is a platform I'm going to be on now. Okay, that's a little bonus untitled Criterion subseries uh, within this <laughs> uh, Horror Nights <laughs> recap. Um, so, yeah, extras is definitely not worth the wait in line. Uh, but... I mean, I'm glad we did it just because I'm glad we did everything. Yeah, but, of course. Sorry, Charlie. I know you have deep personal attachment to the Exorcist maze. Um, so then we uh, stopped to look at merch for a little bit. And uh, we noticed that the uh, bulk of the, like, Horror Nights merch, like Hollywood's, uh, Universal Studios Hollywood branded merch, has three characters on it. The Monster of Frankenstein, the Bride of Frankenstein... And Chucky. Sure. Those three together at last. Hello, friends. This seemed odd to us because Chucky has no real presence at Horror Nights other than the commercial for his TV show and the voice on the Starway. I know in years past, sometimes they've done like a uh, uh, an animatronic Chucky up on the balcony that's like radio controlled where he's like insulting the guests and stuff. Like, yeah. like hey, you down there, blah, blah, blah. But uh, they were not doing that this year. Chucky's only presence was commercials and safety rules that were done for cross-promotion. So putting Chucky front and center on the merch has some real putting Elmo on the DVD cover of Follow That Bird energy. Yeah. I wonder, too, like, if well, then maybe some of this merch is, like, holdover from what they were planning for last year. But then, obviously, the You world. know, that's possible. That's possible. But also, when it's just those three characters, what I have to assume from this is that uh, Frank and his bride were looking for a third, and they found Chucky. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Yeah. A, a polyamorous monster triad. <laughs> and I hope the three of them are very happy together. Me too. Uh, so then we go back to the upper lot. We do the final maze of the night, you know, not counting Walking Dead, because that's not really a Horror Nights maze. It was just there for Horror Nights. Final maze of the night, Halloween for the return of Michael Myers. I could not tell you if I've ever seen the movie Halloween 4 or not. <laughs> I, I, I do not remember. 
I've seen bits and pieces of so many of the Halloween movies. We were having the debate in line. We were trying to remember wh which franchise had been rebooted, retconned, or soft rebooted more, Halloween or Terminator. I'm pretty sure it's neck and neck. Yeah, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, every couple of years, it's like, here's a new Halloween that's completely new. Or, here's a new Halloween where only one and two are canon. Or, here's a new Halloween where... None of them are canon. Or here, and here's a new Terminator. Like, look, we've made our 18th Terminator 3. This time we got it right. It's personal. <laughs> so the queue for the queue for Halloween 4 is just uh, going around behind the Waterworld bleachers. Of course. And then coming up through uh, in front of the Waterworld bleachers. So we got a up close and personal look at the Waterworld set. Cool, cool. And the maze is basically just in the Waterworld. Q. That's where they were doing uh, the maze. Okay. So, uh, Halloween 4, I thought was fine as a maze. It was a little repetitive in the sense that uh, most of the characters are just Michael Myers. Yeah. But you kind of expect that. But it had, um, it had more interesting sets to walk through than, again, Exorcist, where most of the characters were just kind of Pazuzu, but humanoid Pazuzu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you were, you were walking through the houses and everything, and... Yeah, it was, uh, I thought Halloween 4 was pretty neat. Um, I think the others didn't like it quite as much as I did, but, uh... Yeah, my bottom for the night was still Texas Chainsaw. Again, if we had given it another chance, maybe it would have gone up in the rankings. Mm -hmm. But, uh, we decide to do... Uh, Bride one last time. Now it actually has a line because I guess word of mouth has gotten out that this is a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, we do Bride one last time. It's still very good, but uh, the first room is like the bride, like sort of mourning over the monster's dead body and, and like before she drags him away. And I happened to be walking by, I guess, right as there was a changing of the guard and like the bride was like shuffling away backstage. And, uh -huh. and again, no, no shame in that. I, I know these things are hard to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm on that side of it a lot and mm -hmm. I will be soon. Come check out Pumpkin Eater. Um, by the time you're hearing this, uh, Scary Farm has already started. So come, mm -hmm. come see me in Pumpkin Eater. I will be a pumpkin scraper. You know, that clear concept that you will immediately recognize when you see me. Go roast my husband in Pumpkin Eater, please. <laughs> <laughs> do not physically touch me. But uh, <laughs> we do Bride one last time. It's still great. And then, like, everyone's starting to call it a night. Uh, uh, Chris and Madeline go home. Uh, Casey wants to go get one more thing of merch, so so she goes off, and I'm like, I'm gonna get one more refill. And then at the last minute, I start thinking, you know, I should do Walking Dead one last time, not because I have particular love for Walking Dead, the attraction, but largely just to get one last chance for an extra pass at B roll in yeah. case I need. In case I need alternate takes for the Blitz Travifornia. Of course, darling. So I'm like, eh, what's the difference? I'll do Walking Dead one more time. The wait time was posted at 35 minutes. I was through the entire maze in 10 minutes. So, no shock there. So the wait time exaggerated. And that was with, like, stopping in the queue and letting people go ahead of me to, uh, to get extra close-ups of B-roll. In the queue, there was something I've never seen before, and I don't know if this has always been there and I just missed it, or if they were only doing this for Horror Nights. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're in the hospital, like right before the maze proper starts, they had a video screen there with like a, a guy doing like a video feed. It's, it's like, like, hey, the hospital's no longer safe. Come to the prison. We've got food and everything. You, you know, you're going to come to the prison. But here's the rules for safety. No flash photography. That'll attract the zombies. Uh, do, do, and it was like doing all the safety rules, but leaving, but actually having in-universe explanations for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, do not touch the zombies. That's a surefire way to die. <laughs> and, and it's like, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that video has always been part of this because I've never seen it before. Yeah, I don't remember seeing it the, the one time I went. So. But I also don't know if that's just because every other time I've done it, I've done it when it's a walk-on and I'm not waiting in the queue long enough to see the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To see the pre-show video, but... Uh, if that's always been there, I will, I will look up information to find out if that's always been there. And if it has been, I will add a bit in the Blitz Travifornia where I do a little riffing on that. Sounds good. Um, 
But yeah, Walking Dead, it's still Walking Dead. It's still exactly the same. It's still fine. The one thing that was different that I noticed this time is uh, there are a couple of human soldiers in the, ma uh, in the maze who are like, you know, shooting off zombies. And I noticed that the human soldiers were wearing rubber masks of human faces, presumably so they could wear their uh, COVID safety masks under those. Nice. I don't think I would have noticed this if I wasn't looking for it, because, uh -huh. you know, the human soldiers are far away enough. But I was like, that's definitely not your real face. Ah, and you're not wearing a mask. So uh, that was one workaround that this maze tried and no others did. Cool. I wonder how much of that was because of like some contract with AMC where they're like, you you, you got to make everything look real. Like you can't break the immersion. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Or if it was just like the leads of this maze thought of it and the leads of the others didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but then I head on home. I get home at some ungodly hour. I go to sleep. I wake up. I go back to sleep. I wake up. I eat two slices of pizza and... We start recording this. Indeed. So, uh, yeah, final verdict. Horror Nights was a lot of fun this year. Uh, it was fun. It was fun to go with friends. It was fun to do. Glad we got to do it. Um, I would not recommend it to you, honey, because I know you would not enjoy it. But uh, I, I had a very, very chill evening, you know, cleaning the bathroom and uh, rewatching all of British Bake Off while you were gone. So I have nothing to complain about. Honestly, that also sounds very fun. Yeah. I do recommend looking up walkthroughs of the uh, the Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, which I will do because yes. like I really enjoy watching the walkthroughs because those are a way for me to get you know enjoy it without actually having to be there. But you yeah. can see all the theming and the aesthetics without the risk of personal space violation. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, horror nights, lots of fun, mm -hmm. uh, and Texas Chainsaw is probably better most of the time than it was when I experienced it. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe it would have been better if I had any familiarity with the source material. But now the time comes for me to go headfirst into being a character myself. Yeah. So by the time you're hearing this, I am hard at work at Scary Farm. Come on down to Pumpkin Eater, where I will scrape pumpkin in front of you. And I will probably be getting uh, tacos from the vegan restaurant nearby, just, you know, posting a glass in your honor. Exactly, exactly. We both have our Halloween traditions. There we go. <laughs> and until next time, this has been At Home with the Dogginses. Later days, y'all. Later days. Later days.